Okay, you guys. I did not say I was going live, but I am going live. I did decide to go live to do my video today to share it with you guys. Instead of recording something and then posting it later, I decided to do this prophetic video for the month of September and actually year ahead live. Um, so if you guys have any questions that I could possibly answer, and I think it may be a longer video, so I'll let it interact. So if you know somebody that is that you think would be interested in this content, please share it. Hello, whoever is watching. I am just giving it a minute for people to hop on, and then I am going to begin sharing this video. Uh, I'm going to begin sharing as um, as people hop on. So I'm just going to share. I wish I had more of a regular schedule, but I'm going to, I decided to go ahead and hop on. So I'm just going to be sharing here um, about the biblical calendar. I have some videos that I will link later to um, understand more about the biblical calendar. If that's something that you're interested in, then I have some link some other videos that you can learn more about the biblical calendar and why it's important for Christians. So it's important for Christians to understand the biblical calendar. I'll just give a brief overview before getting into the prophetic is because that is the clock that God tells time by. That is the clock that Jesus is going to come back by. That is where all um, biblical prophecy about the end times, which we are in now, is mapped out. Nobody knows the day or the hour that Jesus will come back, but everything that has happened is based on God's Hebraic and biblical calendar. And the reason why it's also called a Hebraic calendar is because the Bible, the original language of the Bible was um, Hebrew, and then it was also, hello there, blessings to you. And it was also Aramaic. And so that is what they spoke. But in the Hebrew alphabet, it's called the Aleph Bet, right? I want y'all to see, I got clothes on. So, okay. It's called the Aleph Bet. And in the Aleph Bet, there, everything has a picture. The alphabet has a picture and a number. So there's a picture graph. There's something that denotes a picture. I'm saying that so I can tell you about the. So there's a picture and there's a number that is related to also an alphabet. So there's a phonic sound to put things together to create words. There's also, unlike us, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They have one, one letter. Alphabet versus our al alphabet has a sound, a phonic sound, an image, picture graph, which is pictorial value, and it has numeric value. And so 5781, when we try and interpret it through the scriptures, because God is a prophetic God. And so when he was telling them to write things and when he was doing things, they were writing in this language that was the language almost of heaven. So you could speak, so you could say in one way, because there was pictures and images. This is why in the Old Testament, when people named their children, all these names had prophetic meanings to them. They didn't just name their child Krista or Johnny or whatever. They named their child like God, he who is going to harvest or whatever the name meant. It had value to it as their words did, as their letters did. They had picture and meaning to them. And so God is a God who gives us images, who creates and gives us images of images in the mind. And so everything about the biblical calendar is a picture, a type and shadow of things to come in Christ Jesus. When we look at the Old Testament, when we look at the biblical calendar, even all the feasts are, some have been fulfilled and some will be fulfilled, but they are connected to 
Christ Jesus and what he has done and the prophetic things that he would fulfill. And so I'm saying that to say that 5782, the number two in the Aleph bet, and I'm not, I have studied for over a decade now, but I wouldn't call myself fluent or an expert, but I am very careful to try and be, to try and share what I understand. And this is something that the Lord has given me for over a decade to share. And so the number two in the Aleph bet is the number two. It's also the letter. It's not I in, let me just look it up here. I should have brought that for you guys, but I wanted to share more about the meaning. It means house or a building. And so God wants to do something with the house this year, with the building of the church. God wants to do something. There are there are several different houses. There's a church. There he says there is a house of the Lord. And then there is the house that our temple that Christ dwells in, that the Holy Spirit dwells in. And so God wants to do something. And what he told me when he woke me up the other night, and I just want to get this. Um, I want to get this meaning for y'all of this letter, this number two, which is the year we're entering into on the biblical calendar. It's 5782. And so on the biblical calendar, 5782, let me just go here and then I'll get into this after I give you the the um the names I mean give you the the alphabet that it matches I'm sorry so we are still in 5781 and we are going to 5782 and the numbers two the pictograph is that of a house or a structure and then the letter is bet B-E-T. So it is bet, B-E-T. And so, not B-E-T, the um, the station or whatever, but bet as in um, two or house or building. And let me just read some of this. Actually, let me get into, because I'm going to preach on this at another time, but let me get into what the Lord has shown me. I don't want to be long, but I do want to be direct. I believe that the word this month is that God is building. He is, he is tearing down things. Jeremiah says that he puts his word in our mouth so that we can build up so, and we can tear down. And there are things that God wants to do. Hosea 6, 1, I believe it says that God, um, Binds or he, let me just go down. Sorry, he tears down so that he can heal, right? And so he does things in our lives, he brings things in our lives. God is not the God of destruction or evil, and he does not cause evil, but sometimes God has to let something be broken so that it can be healed in our lives because we try to do things and it's not God's way. Okay, here it is. Come and let us return to the Lord, unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. So that which he has to tear down, then he will bring back together. And let me just put it this way so I can just come together with this. I woke up the other night and, and the Lord was causing me to go into intercession, into prophetic intercession. And he took me to the book of Haggai about building the house. And Haggai is a prophet who is near Zechariah and the build, the rebuilding of the temple. There's not a lot known about him. He's like somebody who comes in and you don't hear a lot about him in any other time or any other way. But he's this prophet that comes and deals with the children of Israel about the fact that they had built their houses and not built the house of God, that they had not paid attention and that they had. And he also talked about that which is clean and unclean and how they had mixed the the sacrifices with the unclean. And, and the Lord began to show me that he has to tear down things in the church 
not just in our lives, but we are the church that are unclean. And unclean is simply that which is not holy and set apart. And there's a scripture in Haggai that says, if the clean and the unclean touch each other, then is it going to be clean or unclean? And the answer is unclean. And so when you begin to mm, deal with things that are unclean in your life, you may think that you are still clean, but when you're dealing with something, so I'm coming for somebody tonight that has something unclean in their life, and it may not, you may not think it's unclean, but when you entertain things through your eye gates, your ear gates, and different gates of your life that are not, and I, I don't want to preach religion, um, but I do want to know, I do want to say that God is a God who is holy and that he still requires holiness of his people. And that means to be set apart and sanctified. And in this world and in this time where there's so much that is acceptable, that sometimes we unknowingly miss the mark. Sometimes we unknowingly let things in and God wants to clean his house. Why? So that he can have a strong house. So the first house is you. It is as we're the tabernacle of God. We're the tabernacle and the temple of the Holy Spirit. And But the Bible also talks about God being a holy. We make a holy habitation unto God. But not only do we make a holy habitation unto the Lord, but on top of that, the Bible talks about the house house of the Lord. So what is the house of the Lord? It is the heavenly abode of God. It is the resting place of God. It is the presence of God where we can abide in his presence under his wing. And so there's an abode of God. And then there is the temple of God, which we are. And even though they are in different realms, it's all this, it's all the presence of God. But when we have things, so this year, right, this year that we're entering into 5782 or 2022 is the year of building. It, the word itself, bet, B-E-T, means house or structure. And so as we look at the prophetic over this year and what God wants to do, he wants to build his house. He wants to restructure his house, but there's some things that he has to tear down so that he can rebuild the foundation. When somebody restructures a house, a lot of times they take out the old wood that is um, rotten. They check the foundation. They tear down things so that they can rebuild things. When somebody takes a house that needs to be restructured. Uh, I've, I've probably remodeled two houses, not from the restructuring, but just from the floors and that type of thing and uh, windows and different things. And you tear those things out and you get rid of the old. You don't fix it. You remove it. And so God is going to do some bending and some breaking and some tearing out so that he can rebuild you up. And there's a word <clears throat> And I will link it later that God said that he's going to give his people a heavier weight of glory. He wants us to be able to carry a heavier weight of glory. And some that were carrying the glory because of the uncleanness, because when you are, there's a book by Kim, Kim, what is her name? Kim Dam Daniels, Kimberly Daniels. And the Lord brought that book to my mind. I haven't read it in decades, but she put it out and it's called clean house, strong house. And there is something about being a vessel unto the Lord that is clean, that doesn't have secret sin. And sometimes we only think of sin as the things of the flesh, but there are sins of the spirit, sins of the mind. There's the pride of life. There's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. There's high mindedness. There's gossip. There's all kinds of things. And whatever is not of faith, is sin. And so it's an unpopular message, but God is calling his church to be holy because the things that we are going to face in these coming days, there needs to be power in his vessels. And God began to even deal with me. And he said, there are those, oh God, that you come to the place of birthing, but you can't push forth. Why? Because the strength when you when 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 you are not living clean. And again, sometimes the enemy will deceive you into thinking 
that certain things are okay, that for a vessel, depending on what God has called you to do, to whom much is given, much is required. So there are some that may not require he wants us all to be holy as he is holy and be sanctified, but your calling may not depend on it. So you may get away with certain things, but he says that there are those, not many should be to be teachers because we will receive the greater punishment. So maybe I'm just talking to myself, but the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and he began to talk about Haggai. He began to talk about in Haggai, it talks about building the house. It talks about we when we go and build our own houses and do our own things and do not build the house of the Lord. And many people would take that as just the church, right? But that is your own life because we are the church. The church is not just the building, even though in that, that chapter, I mean, in that book, the prophet was talking about rebuilding the temple. But now that we are in a dispensation of grace, and of the church, we have to look at what the church is. It's the ecclesia. It's those that meet in fellowship in the administration of God that has power. And we do meet in a building. And so there are there's a house of God as in the building of God. But there's when we go off and leave away from our calling to do, to settle for less than God has called us to do. So there's some things that God has called you to do. And instead of building that, many people go off and do what they want to do instead of building the kingdom and building God's house and God's work. And Peter said, I will, Jesus said to Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That we, amen, he must increase, that we must decrease, that so he must, we must decrease so that he can increase. But not only that, but we must be holy as he is holy. Those who bear the vessels of the Lord have to be holy. And so God in this year, this prophetic season, um, the Lord says, I will crown the year with goodness. And your path will drip with fatness and abundance. And so there's a blessing over every year. So the Lord puts a prophetic blessing over every year. And even though we're in the New Testament and we don't we don't pay attention to new moons and signs and all those things that are the types and shadow of Christ, we do tell time by God's calendar. And we understand our times and seasons by this word, just like we read the Bible for deeper understanding, when we go a little bit deeper and we understand the biblical meaning of what he is saying, then we understand the blessing over each year. Now we're blessed anyway in Christ Jesus, but then you begin to walk in step with God when you understand what he is saying over each year, right? The prophetic meaning over the alphabet, because the alphabet has prophetic expression in it. So the word of God that is in the Hebrew alphabet, the scripture, the original language of the Bible, and what they spoke was pictures and numbers that they put things together to make pictures. And that's why names and everything was so prophetic. And that's why he said, write the vision and make it plain that those who run may read it because they were seeing more than just letters like we see and we read. And that's why there were seers because God often gives prophecies in images because that is how he shows us stuff because he's a creative God. So going back to that, the word over this year matters and the word is house. And so when God is talking about building his house, he is saying that there are some things that have to be removed so that he can build better. Have you ever just, hmm, broke down some stuff in the house. <laughs> I, my kids tell me that I have, I have, I like doing houses. And so I will just, you know, buy a house just to rebuild it. I, you know, if I had more time, I might even just do like, what is it called? Um, be one of those people who, what is it called? They resell houses, build them. And cause I love doing that type of stuff. But anyway, I digress. But when you just break down a room and do something completely different with it, when you restructure it, when you change it, when you change the foundation and you make sure it's strong. So there's some things that God has to clean out. And when you're cleaning out things in a house to rebuild, 
Yes, flip houses. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Phoebe. Bless the Lord. When you are, when you flip houses, when you're cleaning out things to go through those rooms, right? Then you go through the rooms and you break it and you find things. And you're like, what is all this stuff that we're going through? I remember moving out of my house in 2017, the house I raised my children in. Um, I married and divorced in and had, did all these things in 20 something years living in the same house. Right. There were so many things when I, when I moved and downsized the first time, it was like, we had stuff in the garage. I mean, there was stuff that was about 20 years. I mean, it was just so much stuff that you find. Right. And so God wants to clean out the house so that he can rebuild it and restructure it. Some foundations. He said he will rebuild the ancient ruins and the foundations so that you can be stronger so that this time when he pours in the anointing, it's not going to fall out of broken vessels. Sometime we're living. Oh God. Okay. Mm. See, I shouldn't have did this as a lie because I'm going to tell on myself that I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead because I want to help somebody. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with myself. Sometimes we have so much going on. And as I've already said, sin is not always the kind of the flesh. Sometimes sin is doubt and unbelief and not spending time with God and doing things our own way. And it can be a number of things. So it doesn't matter what sin it is. It doesn't matter how, how you're missing the mark. Let me put it that way. If you miss the mark long enough, then your strength goes out. If you stay in unforgiveness long enough, if you, if you stay in, um, not only unforgiveness, offense, or things like that. If you talk negatively long enough, if you begin to do things, then the vessel begins to leak. And so you cannot hold the anointing. So God needs to restructure some things. So if it's the, if it's the year of the house that he's going to rebuild his house so that the gates of hell cannot prevail, the church is the house. We are the church. So we are the church. So before he starts with a building, beloved, which he will build, because the Bible says in Ephesians that we are growing up together to make a holy habitation in the Lord. So that habitation is a house of God that we create this house and then we meet in a building for corporateness to come together right and so when that happens so he has to start i'm saying that because he has to start with you it, it sometimes we think of the building because that's what haggai talked about and let me get this here but the because they were talking about the temple but that was when the holy spirit wasn't in us when we weren't priests and kings unto god that was when there had to be a priest that ministered only the priest could minister, but now we are the church. We are the tabernacle. And that doesn't mean that you don't go to church. I am, I've been in a local body for over 20 years and I wouldn't have it any other way. I think there's something about being in a local church that establishes um, connectivity. The Bible says forsake not the fellowship of one another as some do and go astray. When you move away from the body, you go astray. You begin to do your own thing. You begin to not have any checks and balances in your life. So you could, and that's what the enemy looks for. He looks for people who like the sheep that get lost so that he can snatch them. He snatches the sheep that are, are astray and lost. And so if you don't have a local church. You need to be in a local church. The local church is what strengthens you. Today, I'm talking about the house of God. How is the bread fraud? I, I don't know what he's saying. So I, I don't know about the, um, so the house of God, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the house of God today. Today, I'm talking about the, um, not the house of God, but building yourself up. But part of building yourself up, part of building yourself up is, um, so we're going to have to remove this shoes because I don't know what they're talking about. Um, so part of building, put this shoes up, let me time out. Okay. So part of building yourself up is being connected in a local body, right? And so 
when you build yourself up in a local body, that's one thing. That's not what I'm talking about today. I had to deal with something. I'm on my computer today. The other week I was doing it from my phone and we had some people in here bad acting. And so I couldn't get to them. So I'm, I'm on my computer now so I can see these comments and deal with them right away because some people get inappropriate or just downright rude. And if you don't like what we're talking about, then you have every right to not watch. Um, however, back to the point. So God wants to build you up in a local church, right? But also he wants to build you up so that the gates of hell cannot will not prevail against you. And so he said, I, on this rock, on the truth of Jesus, on the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against that. Right. And so what I want to say, so so he this this book of Haggai is about rebuilding the temple, about rebuilding the temple. The time has come that you should build the Lord's house. And he says that you dwell in your houses and but you haven't built my house. And then he says in Haggai 1 6 and the Lord woke me up and gave me this word. He says, you have so much and bring in little you eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You are you drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself. Let me take this out the King James Version and slow myself down a little bit. You drink, but you are never full. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You have looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself in his own house. And so God begins to deal with the people about building his house. And as I was saying that this was about the temple, uh, Haggai was a prophet that was near to Zechariah. Um, let's see, he is over here right before Zechariah, him and Zechariah were contemporaries. That means that if you, of course, many of you know that they were prophets of the same time. They were in the same space. They were, they came along at the same time, but there's not a lot of information about Haggai. He comes in with these two chapters and he brings it in two chapters. As Zechariah is prophesying about building the house and he is he is talking about the priest and all of this. And, and there's a whole book on the house being built. It's Zechariah and Nehemiah and all of that about building the house. Here comes Haggai with two chapters about telling the people, you have not built my house. You're not paying attention. And that which you are offering in my house is unclean. And so God wants to restructure. He wants to clean out his house so that it can be strong again, so that we can carry the anointing again in a way that we see signs and wonders. There's a lot of people coming to the altar and there are healings. There are healings. I've heard about healings in our church when, when we pray for people and you just pray and you believe God that he's going to do what he's going to do, but power belongs unto God. And so when we hear about somebody who was healed through our online prayer ministries and, and that type of thing, we bless God because the glory belongs to him. But the thing is, is that we ought to be able to cast the devil out. We ought to be, somebody ought to be able to come to the altar and get all the way healed and get all the way delivered. And so there has to be power in the vessels of the Lord. And in order for there to be powers in the vessels of the Lord, those who bear the things of the Lord, those who are praying and preaching and prophesying and laying hands and teaching, um, we have to be clean. And so there's some things that he has to clean that we, and that means we have to focus on his house. And before we focus on just the building, which we need to do already, which I've already uh, mentioned that you need to be a part of a local body, a good, healthy body with the sound foundation that is treat, teaching the word of God and all those things. And so many people 
I watch people online too. I have a local church I've been a part of for 20 something years, but I watch, um, there's ministries that I follow and watch online. Um, and so it's good to be online. Thank you for watching me here. And for those of you who regularly watch and subscribe, but there's nothing like a local body to work out your salvation in, even though you have to do it for your own in, on your own within yourself. There's nothing like having the fellowship in and, and and just like any place, nothing is perfect. No pastor is perfect. No church is perfect. And if it was the minute that you or I got there, it would be unperfect because we are not perfect. And when Jesus talks about being perfect and when the Bible talks about being perfect, it means per be complete and be mature. It doesn't mean be without any flaw. Jesus is the spotless lamb. That's it. That's all. That's why he had to die for our sins, because we miss the mark. But we come to a place where we're walking in grace and we grow into that. But you grow when iron sharpens iron. And so we've talked about the church and the local body and being connected to people. But what I want to talk about and what the Lord showed me the other night is that he's going to start cleaning houses that he's going to start. Mm. And then Sunday morning, I said, Lord, you know, I'm just, you know, hearing the Lord and I'm praying and asking God what he wants to show me. And he wakes me up and I can't sleep. And so I go into intercession prayer and he has me up in the middle of the night praying and all of this. But then yesterday morning at pray, I mean, at at church, a prophetic word came forth about God. And I just because he shows me something doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to release it or that it's for anybody else or that he's just trying to build it in me for a time before I'm able to release it. But he had me to release yesterday morning in church that he is breaking, that he is bending so that he can rebuild. And so there are things that didn't work in your life. There might be someone who's watching right now that you had your whole plan and it didn't work the way that you thought it was going to work. And he said, I broke it. I bent it because I needed you to do it my way so that it was by my plan and my will and according to my plan. Because when we are building things and we're building our own house and we're doing our own thing, if God lets that go forward, then you will take credit for it. There are some things that are not going to that that if God were to let his people, mm, let me put it this way. Hebrew says those he loves, he chastens. And if he doesn't chasten you, he does not discipline you, then you are not a son or a daughter. You are a bastard. You are not his child. So you know that you are God's child when he begins to discipline you. So there are some things that if God lets you get away with, if God lets you come into what he had for you before breaking things off of you and rebuilding you and before making you deal with things so that you could be a clean vessel, so you could put down that one thing he's been asking you for, and it may not be a big sin. For some, it might be gossip. For some, it might be lying. For some, it might be fear. For some, it might be unbelief or doubt. For some, it might be a fear of giving. I'm not tithings. For some, it might be a fence with the church. For some, it might be, sometimes he just gives that one instruction, that one direction. And we're asking God why things aren't working. But right here in Haggai, I'm sorry, I don't know why my nose always does this. Um, he says that he did it. You've so much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with hoes. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. And so sometimes, sometimes people, sometimes people use this scripture as an offering scripture to talk about how we use money for ourselves but don't build the house of the Lord. But I want you to consider your ways and go deeper. Maybe it's not, maybe you have enough. Maybe your home is not blown away. Maybe these are not the things, but maybe that one thing that you've been asking God for, that one thing that you've been wanting from God, there's something that he wants you to do. 
And then let's talk about the house of the Lord and the vessel of the Lord. So he needs you to do that, to consider your ways and to clean the things out that he's asking you. God is going to put his finger on some stuff in this season. I truly believe that God wants not only is it about you asking him for something that he cannot do, that he that he doesn't he doesn't want to give you for your own good until you come up above and deal with that which is working in you. But there are also the that this generation, his generation, amen, his gen, this generation needs some vessels. The kingdom of God, the Bible said, is in, not in meat and drink, but in power. It's not only in word, but it's in power and the Holy Spirit. There has to be a demonstration of power. That's the glory of God that only an anointed vessel can handle. And sometimes we're so scattered. Sometimes we have so much going on. The enemy is attacking and attacking and attacking and attacking. He especially attacks those, attacks those who are vessels of the Lord. He especially brings things against the house, against the people, against the souls and the spirits and the lives and the families of those who have a call to reach people, to reach nations, to bring in souls. Because if he can get you to a place where you're doing a lot, but you're not effective. You could be a big ministry or a small ministry. You can have a lot of people coming to your church and no one is being changed. Or you could be a small ministry like me, but you're not effective. Or you could be saving other people and losing your own soul, right? So it doesn't matter. It's not the size. It's the assignment. So there's no need to compare. Are you effective in your call? And sometimes you're effective and that's where the enemy begins to play games and make you think you're doing something. But the enemy, that's the, that is the deception of the enemy to make us think that we are okay, to make us settle for less because we don't want to go the whole way. Haggai said, consider your ways. Jesus said, count the cost. We have to count the cost for the high calling. There is a cost. And I don't want to be religious with taste not, touch not, because it's whatever is to you. All things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but all things are not good for me, Paul said. I will not be controlled by anything. So if there's something that is controlling you, if there's something, an appetite that is controlling you, then you need to check it so that you are not controlled by it. So I'm not going to try and be religious. It's between you and God and your own beliefs, which you do and do not do. Peter said the only rules is no fornication and don't drink, don't eat uh, blood and things offered to idols. Now that's what the word said when they wanted to put all the Jewish traditions and religious on the church. Peter and Paul came together and said, mm, we're not doing all of that. We just got free from that. All that we ask is that they do not fornicate and that they do not eat food offered to idols or drink blood. And so anything, but then uh, Paul goes on to say that when we go and do things that make somebody else stumble, then we should be careful that we're making somebody else stumble. So I know I'm going in a different direction, but I want to lay that foundation because we're talking about holiness and we're talking about vessels of the Lord. And sometimes we mistake holiness for taste taste not, touch not. And that holiness is a matter of the heart. And if you're consecrated unto God and doing what he has told you to do and what's not causing you to some stumble and that you will not be controlled by anything and that nothing will have your heart, nothing will be your God. Nothing will be, if the Holy Ghost, he said, do not be drunk with wine, but with the Holy Spirit. So it just depends on where you're at with that. So we have to, we have to, I don't want to do this in a religious perspective. I want to be clear not to do it that way. But I do want to say that God wants clean vessels. And Jesus, as I was reading up on this this weekend, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean. We're talking about God building his house. This is the year of the house. This is the year of the 
bet the house bet 5782 is a year of god building his house and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church the ecclesia and and the structure we come together when we come together we build up we create a holy habitation for the lord we are the church of the living god so not just the building but those who create the habitation for the lord in the spirit and so we're talking about building building the house so we are the house and god wants to build his house and he's going to do something in the house and he wants to he wants to make the house so that it is strong enough that the gates of hell cannot prevail, which he's already promised us that. But he wants to, the Bible, um, no, it's Kimberly Daniels who has a book that talks about clean house, strong house. Why does she have that book that talk about clean house, strong house? Because if you if you have things going on, then it, then you, it weakens your faith. Sin weakens you. It confuses you. It brings things to you. Disobedience, all those things. And so there's some repenting that we have to do because God wants to rebuild his house. He wants to rebuild the ancient ruins because he has some work for us to do. And so Jesus said that there are some things It's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but come, but what comes out of a man that makes him unclean because the things that come out of a man come from his heart. So in fact, something does go in, but they were talking about religious rituals. So he had to deal with the Pharisees and all of them because they were talking about what people were eating and what they were doing. And if they were washing their hands and all of that, all these religious exercises, but Jesus was saying that it's not that because that goes into the body and then it goes out. He was talking about you, you, your body lets waste go, right? But the truth is that that which comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. There's fighting, there's jealousy, there's anger, there's wrath, there's murder. There's all these things that are in your heart. So again, even though it doesn't go through the mouth, it comes through the gates, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And so what am I saying? What what am I what am I really trying to say today with this long video? I could have did a short video and just did a teaching video and let it go at that. But what I'm really trying to say, and if you could like this video and share it, I haven't even said that. If you have never subscribed, please subscribe and like this video and share it with someone. It really helps me. So I'm trying to do more live videos. Um, however, what am I saying today? I am saying. That God is calling his church back to holiness. Yes, the gates of hell will not prevail. And with the gates of hell, when, you, when you're losing, we're not supposed to lose. And God was dealing with me and he was showing me things. And he said, you have to be able in this next season that I'm bringing you into there are things that have started seeping that have weakened because when the enemy keeps on attacking, attacking, attacking. So he takes an anointed vessel and you can preach and you can teach and you and there is power. But you have to be able to carry a heavier weight of glory. Right. And so there's a heavier weight of glory coming to the church. And if we do not. Rebuild the structures and the broken places. We will not be able to carry that glory. Let's talk about what glory is. It is the manifested presence of God that often shows up in signs and wonders and and um, words of knowledge and wisdom and prophetic prophetic ministry and those types of things. It's not just prophetic ministry. I am a prophet. I have a prophetic ministry. The Lord get, has given me that and the the seer anointing. However. Prophetic ministry is so blown up. We're speaking into people's lives a lot. However, there is something. It's not the, the kingdom of God is not just in word, but it is in power and the Holy Spirit. There has to be a demonstration of power. You can prophesy unclean. The Bible talks about lying prophets who lie, who prophesy out of their own soul and out of their spirit. And it's easy to get into that, especially when you have a prophetic ministry, because people then want prophecy. So you have to watch yourself that you're not just saying something to say it, but that you're allowing God to use you. Number one. Number two, um, 
that you're just not praying for somebody and saying what you think you see or what you hope for them and pray for them. But when you release a prophetic word, um, it should be what the Lord is saying, what you are foreseeing through the spirit. And so we have abused that ministry. But God is saying that he wants more than prophetic ministry. If we read the word, come on, then we don't need so much personal prophecy, right? If we keep our word before us, we don't need a lot of personal prophecy. We do need it. Now, somebody needs to be encouraged. Somebody needs to hear it. I'm not saying that there's no place. I prophesy. I'm not saying that there's no place for it. What I am saying is that you ought to be able to get a word for yourself. And um, along with prophecy, somebody ought to have a confirming word for you. Or if they're telling you something, it ought to be something that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know is from God and not just something that is tickling your fancy. That's something that's making you feel like, oh, I'm going to get a house. I'm going to get a husband. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. What is God saying about my future? Usually when prophesied, it was you, you have to go this place. God is going to do this. Sometimes we prophesy things, we foresee the future, and it's not always great. But God forewarns us about things. So sometimes the prophet comes and it's like, oh, God, this is about to happen. But God is telling you to prepare you. A lot of times that's how the prophetic work, because God loves his people. And even when you're going through a hard season, he will tell you what is about to come so he can prepare you and equip you and empower you to face off your enemy and to overcome. So prophecy is not always just for the wonderful things that he's going to do. That's in the book. Um, now the power of God, the power of God, he says there's a heavier weight of glory coming. And I guess I'm just preaching to myself, but we have to get some things together. And God says, oh God, I don't even know if I could, that we have to consecrate again. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just me. There has to be a fasting schedule again, not just the beginning of the year fast with your local church. But God is calling some people to fast and to pray, to call out things in the spirit, to go before the things that happen and to meet them in the spirit. The Bible says that Steph Stephen was it Stephen was caught up in the book of Acts and he met he went and met the eunuch on the road. And he preached to him and explained the book of Isaiah to him, the scriptures. And when he had done baptizing the eunuch of Candace, the Ethiopian queen, he was on business for the queen. Then he went on someplace else. The Lord picked him up and took him back. This is the same Stephen that Paul held the coats of those who stoned him to death. That was the power of God that he could lift him up in the spirit realm and begin to have a minister someplace that he can, he can cause you to pray out things that you, that he, that he's using you to see and to do heavenly warfare in the, in the, in the spirit realm for his kingdom. But you know, that takes something. That's the, that's the thing. It takes something It costs something. Oh God. Mm. It costs something. And that's the problem that we don't want to pay the cost. And so God is inviting his people. To pay the cost to the higher calling. It's I like to call it the called, the call to the called. That Paul calls it the high calling of God. And Philippians, it is the high calling of God where you count everything and loss for the sake of knowing him, that those who suffer with him will also reign with him. And so as this is the year of the house, the year of bet, some people don't, you know, like the biblical calendar, but there's so much to it that we that we see with the God's prophetic expression over the year. 
we see what he's saying over the year and what he wants to do. And so God can always do these things. You could clean up and get holy and deal with things anytime. So we don't take away from the fact that Christ has finished the work, but we do say that God made a biblical calendar. He instituted time. And then he instituted these feasts for the types and shadow of things to come in Christ, who has fulfilled most of the feast. And there are more to come. The Feast of Trumpets. There's a couple of other ones. I'm sorry. And so he he does this and he gives this biblical calendar and he gives an alphabet. So the biblical calendar is based on the alphabet. The alphabet is the Hebrew alphabet. Every word, if you didn't already hear this, has every letter has a picture, pictorial value numeric value and um, phonic sound. So when we talk about phonics, we talk about putting A and B and C together to uh, cab, C-A-B, you cab, you know, so they put pictures together. So there's a phonic sound so that they can write. And then there's a pictorial value. So 5782 is the two is what we look at when we look at the prophetic word. So we look at the decade. So we're in 80. And then we look at the so we look at the decade, which is 80 right now. We were in 70. So we go to 80 and then we so we know what the decade is. And then from there, we also look at the 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 number of the year instead of 2022. We look at the two because there's pictorial value in that in that word. Right. In that in that number. And what is the picture? The picture is of a house. And so if God is talking about the house. We are the house. We are the temple of the living God. And so in that, let me go just back here to the alphabet so I can tell you what the 80 is. The 80 is pay. And it means mouth. Pay, P-E-Y, pay, like say. And then the, the two is bet. And so he's building his house. And it's interesting that my pastor gave a word as he was preaching yesterday. And let me just go to Jeremiah, right? Because Jeremiah says, I'm going to use my phone. It'll be faster while I'm here. Jeremiah in the book of Jeremiah chapter one. He says, I have put my words in your mouth. First, he touched his mouth. And then he says, I put, I have set you this day over the nations. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over the nations and over kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build and to plant. So how do we build? How do we uproot? How do we tear down with our mouth? The Bible says that we can tear each other down with our mouth and we can also build each other up with our mouths. We are the house. We are the temple of the living God. And so as we're talking about pay, what we say, the decade of pay, that's the 80, 57, 82 and house. We God wants to build his house. And so we build the house by not only what we say, but the cleanness of the house. Because when I had the dream, the Lord began to show me. He asked me in Haggai about clean and unclean. And he took me to that scripture. And he said, if something clean, and let me just go there. I'm going to close in a minute. And something unclean. Let me see. I'm going to go to the scripture because I want to read this. See, and Haggai even spoke to Zerubbabel, who was the prophet in uh, Zechariah as they were building the house. Mm. So he was talking to the priest here in chapter two. And it says. On the 13th, on the 24th day of the ninth month, Haggai two. Verse 10, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with the dead body, these are religious rules and whatnot, touches any of these things, 
does it be unclean? Does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with my people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hand, and so it is with every work of their hands, what they offer there is unclean. Now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fear? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there was but 10. So he goes on to explain to them that they are offering unclean things from the time that they built his house. That if, if a priest, if you touch something that is unclean, Paul talks about this. He says light and dark, clean and unclean. He talks about this, right? He says these things to, to the church. That the temple of God and the temple of Baal, that you cannot bring it together. And so he says, and it's a hard saying because, again, we are so inundated in this, in this society. So when the Lord began to speak to me, he said, I want you to go unfollow this, unfollow that, go to your social media. I want it cleaned up because things are coming into your eye gate and your ear gate. And I'm like, you know, Lord, um. Uh, and again, I don't want, if this is not for you, I'm not, I'm not here to argue with you or to, you know, try and give you a whole bunch of religious rules or legalistic and all of that. There is good, clean music. There's good, clean things. But he began to tell me that there's something sometimes we get off and sometimes it's not even that it's unclean. It's that sometimes we get distracted. The James talks about in the book of James, he talks about. Um, that sin starts with a thought and that we're drawn away by our own lust. And lust is not just about sex. It's something that has drawn you away from God. It's a desire. It's an unholy desire for something that God, you could have, you could have right intentions. You can want to have something good, but you can have an unholy desire of it. We talked about all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So when our desire may be for a mate, Maybe for a job, maybe for money or a house or something that you want um, becomes to the point where you're coveting, right? After other things, then it begins to take your eyes off the Lord and it draws you away. Jesus said that the desire for other things chokes the word and it becomes unprofitable. And so there are things that God wants us to let go of so that we can be built up in the spirit to become a holy habitation for him. Because this season, and maybe I'm just talking to somebody who missed the mark, somebody who was not mm, able to bring to birth, somebody who the enemy caught up in the last season, um, who did not watch at the door, who did not keep watch when the enemy came in. Maybe that's who I'm talking to because I went through such a season. Can I just be vulnerable? And it wasn't sin. Sometimes it's just the attack and the attack and the attack. And you, and, and when you get, when you're under such attack, sometimes you just get tired and that's a way that the enemy weakens your foundation as well. And so God says, what is it? And so, and when you get tired, <laughs> I love, I love um, pastor. What is his name? Uh, oh gosh. How can I not think? Um, um, pastor uh, um, um, Charles Stanley. I watch him all the time. One of my favorites. He's got a solid word. He's almost a hundred. He has preached the gospel. He has lived through marriage, divorce, all kind of things, church, but like this, you know, he has, he has, he has remained faithful with God. And um, he talks about halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You have to watch those things. And he uses this acronym halt because that is when you need to stop. And get right because that's when the enemy comes in when you're hungry and that doesn't just mean food when you're hungry when you desire when you have an appetite for something when it's controlling you when you when you are maybe when you when you're hungry for something that you can't have when you're coveting or you're desiring something when you're angry that could also angry another thing that anger leads to is unforgiveness or what is the word um um uh, 
backwards towards somebody, help me. You can be angry. You can have unforgiveness. You can have resentment. You can be holding. Um, there's another word, resentment. There's anger, offense. You can be offended. When, when, so halt, hungry for something to the point where now you're doing things unwise to get what you want, to, what you have an appetite for. When you are angry, when you're offended, when you're hurt and you and it begins to get a root of bitterness. Those are the things that God wants to deal with in this season. When you are lonely, when the enemy has done such to you that you have forsaken maybe the house of God or fellowshipping with other saints. Some people can't go into the house of God. Some people can't get there, especially in COVID. We learned that it doesn't have to be in the building, that we can have fellowship online. Thank God for modern technology. But the fellowship of the saints and checking up with people and being accountable to somebody and letting iron sharpen iron and being able to have people in your life that you can confess to. It says confess your faults to one another. And so fellowship is important when you are lonely, when you don't have those people or you don't feel like you have anybody. I think I've been all of those things when you're when you're tired, when you're tired of serving, when you're tired of doing, when you're tired. These are the things that happen and you have to halt. And when you don't halt and you keep on going, it can you can experience a kind of burnout and that's when the enemy comes in and he begins to wear you out and sometimes just like with your faith with faith when you keep on the bible says jesus said ask and keep on asking knock and keep on knocking because he who asks shall receive and who, who knocks the door shall be open to. Well, in the reverse of that, when the enemy keeps on wearing you out in the same place, the same thing, the same pain, and you don't fix that, it wears you out. It opens, it opens, it opens. And so you have to close those gates. You have to seal up those places in your life. The hedge of protection. I think I have a video about that too. Um, couple of months ago, the Lord showed me that there were hedges, what a hedge was, those gates that need to be closed in our lives. That's how the enemy comes in. A gate was open. A door was open to the adversary. So what gate? So God wants to win in a year of the house. He wants to rebuild. So not only can you be a holy habitation when one part of the body is hurt, all the body hurts. So when you are hurting, when you are not built up on your own house, when your temple, when your vessel is not doing good, when your part of the body is broken and hurt, then that means that there are other people that you cannot, um, that the connection, the holy habitation, the part you're supposed to make up is not there. So some people just keep on going and going to church and stuff, but you're not well. You're you're hurting, but you're going and you're putting on face and you think showing up. But there's a lot of people who are in church who are hurting and God wants to build that house. He wants to restore that building. He wants to restore your life. And so in the year of 5782, bet. B-E-T is the two, the house, the pictograph, the house, the word, the, the letter two. God wants to build you up. He wants to rebuild those places in you where the broken, the Bible talks about broken cisterns, cisterns where things leak out, but God wants to build you up again. He wants to heal you in those places and make you whole. And I heard something this morning and I love, I, I tried, God told me yesterday morning, don't watch anything until after church because I like to know that I'm not prophesying something. I heard another prophet or somebody speak. So many times I can't watch until after church. And when I came back, there were some words that I heard that was what the Lord had spoken to me. Some I was able to share and some I wasn't, but I had received it from the Lord before I heard it from somebody else. And that is what I look for. Right. And so one of the things that, um, I have been talking about and that the Lord has been dealing with me is stepping into the wealthy place. And that wealthy place is a place of peace and prosperity and purpose and promise and rest. And I heard um, uh, 
um, from Gloria and Zion this morning. I watched it this morning. I came home and didn't watch anything after church, but I began to listen this morning as I was getting ready for work about the about there is a rest, my God, that only comes. There's a peace and a rest that only comes to those who win the war. There's a there's a rest. He was talking about um, in the book of Judges and uh, what is his name? Gideon. And he won a war and there was peace or rest for 40 years, the Bible says. But that word rest is another word for shalom. But it is a rest that comes to those who have fought the war and won. And so God wants to give us a rest that comes with the victory. There is a there is the rest that we enter in when we believe in God, but there's a different kind of rest where there's where you where you are not fighting a war. And I believe God wants to bring his people into that place where you have won the victories. You have run the battle in your life. The Bible says that he will cause us to triumph and give us the victory in Christ Jesus and make the knowledge of him uh, the 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 fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ known through us in the earth. And so that comes through getting the victory over things, but you're not going to get the victory. So when he woke me up and laid me out, he began to talk to me about this house. He began to talk to me about being a strong vessel, about building things. And I had knew about the year. I didn't know what he wanted to say to me or to the people and what he wanted me to release. But there's something coming about this year where he wants to build us up so that we have the power to overcome. There are things that you haven't overcome. There are things that you keep hitting. You might be winning in a, some, one place, but there's a place where you keep hitting. But God wants to fill you up so that when you decree a thing, like God said to Jeremiah, that it's going to be with your word. It's going to be with my word. I'm going to put my word in your mouth so that you can build up and so that you can tear down. That there will be such power and anointing that the kingdom of God is not just in words. It's not just words, puff, puff, a lot of teaching and stuff. But there's going to be a demonstration. I'm not saying all churches, but many churches have lost the demonstration. We pray for people. People come to the altar. But there's a demonstration that we need to, that we need to come back. The world is hungry for a demonstration of the things of God. We have, we so need community. We so need rest. And those, that's one of the things that I have, I haven't neglected the fellowship, but being in constant community in these last probably seven years going through different things that you really have to have that connection and community with people and, and to do life with certain people so that you have um, just Christ-centered friends and, and relationships. And so people need that. But on top of that, we've given a lot of ten attention to that. And that is so important, but we can't give so much attention to that, that we get away from. Community helps people stay healed. It brings people in and shows them the love of God and we do life with them. But there's some things that don't come out but by prayer and fasting. And somebody can be in a community and suffering. Somebody can be in a community and sinning. Somebody can be in a community and commit suicide. And so we want to be molesting people. We want to have be where we can have discernment about those that we labor among. We want to be able to have the power to cast something out, to lay hands on the sick. The Bible says, and I promise I'm going to close because I got to get my life together to find something else to do. I got on here and got happy. This is me. I could preach the word and just stay in this place forever. So I have to pull it together. But the Bible says, um, Jesus promised us that the kingdom of God, no, he said that, 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 um, that we would cast out devils. We would pray for the sick they, and we, and they would recover. If we drink any deadly thing, it would not harm us. We would speak with new tongues. And I remember getting filled with the spirit of God in my church. Nobody laid hands on me. Although that is how a lot of people got filled with the spirit. And I don't mean that you're not filled with the spirit if you've been born again and God's spirit is in you. But I'm talking about to the overflow of tongues filled with the heaven, get, being given birthing out of heavenly language. So maybe we shouldn't call it filled with the spirit, but 
speaking in tongues, when you are given that heavenly language. And I remember I said, Lord, your word says, I when we were in a prayer meeting because I used to go into prayer with the older women, the saints of God, and we were at prayer at a midnight prayer. And I was just praying to the Lord in quiet. You know, we have these conversations in your spirit and your mind. And I was saying, Lord, you said that in your name, that those who believe we would prophesy and we would speak with new tongues. And so I'm a believer and I have a right to this. And so I'm saying this to him, right? And nobody knows whether I speak in tongues or not. I just, you know, didn't, I never asked anybody or asked anybody to tarry or anything like that. I just went to the Lord and I said, you know, this is what you said is for me. So the next night, was so that was probably Saturday or Friday. I can't remember whatever prayer service it was because we used to do it must have been a Saturday because we did Friday morning, 6 a.m. and then we did midnight on Saturday to prepare for Sunday. And we would come in there just a small group of us and we would just pray heaven down. And I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. Listen, with these women of God, I didn't know, but it's 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 been a journey. But anyway, I digress. And so we went in on Saturday and we did our midnight prayer and we came out and then the next night, because at that time we had an eight o'clock service, a 11 o'clock service and a 7 p.m. service. So I would get my four little ones up and I would take them to. And by this time, my oldest daughter was old enough to watch them for these things. And God, when he calls you into something, he gives you the grace to do it. So on Friday mornings, I would wake up and and I would get them ready and everything, and they would be ready by the time I got back. And then Friday nights, it was just grace and people helping me watch them and all those different things. God just brought things together. But so Saturday, Sunday morning, we would do 830 and I would take my my kids to church at 830 service. And then we would go back at seven. This was when the power, you know, like. I was newly born again, but the 90s and the 80s, man, there was just something about the glory and the presence of God. Social media has brought in this thing. We have fallen asleep. We have we have lost some of the power in God. That's what I'm talking about. Wants to bring the glory back. This is what he was showing me, that there's going to be a heavier weight of glory for those who get into this move. And it only comes by tarrying with God and, and spending time with him. There's no other way. This is not... This is not a microwave thing. You have to spend time in God's presence to get the anointing, to get the power because he gives it by his grace. It's not something that you can conjure up. We can conjure up words. We can conjure up messages. We can do all of that. We can prophesy out of our own self and sometimes even out of the spirit of God. But the power of God only comes through him. You cannot duplicate. You cannot that the power of God comes through him. You could pray for people and lay hands on them and they could pretend like they healed and be back in the line again because they didn't get healed. But the power of God comes through him. And so this night. I said, Lord, I had prayed this prayer and I had let it go. Yeah, I was younger than the Lord. I didn't even know that I was putting a demand on heaven. Didn't know. And I said. Oh, God. No, we were in we were in uh, seven o'clock. A service we had went back to service and it was a high service and I remember my pastor because the Lord heard me said the Lord wants to fill some people with the with the spirit he wants to fill some people with speaking in tongues tonight and people began to come forward and I didn't go for it I don't know why no I'm gonna be honest I think I was embarrassed because I was with these women who were speaking in tongues and these were intercessors and prayer warriors and all of these things. And I didn't speak in tongues. I was new, but they had taken me under their wing. I don't know how I got caught up with these women of God, these warrior women, these blood bought, pray the devil out of town women. And so anyway, I love them. They're all my spiritual mothers, but yes. Um, so I was in this thing. And so I didn't say anything, but you know what the Lord did? He, um, I began to speak in tongues. I began to speak in, I right there in my seat with nobody laying hands on me. I began to speak in a heavenly language and it was like the spirit lifted me up off the ground. I felt like I was lifted up by the power of God and I began to speak in tongues and then I fell out under the power of God. Nobody laid hands on me. I know that that's not a lot of people's experience and you don't need that to be saved. You don't, you don't need to experience the power of God, but it is available. 
It is available. And the power of God hit me so that I fell out and I went back and I looked at my journal because I had went home and wrote it. And I said, God, no, I wrote it after it happened. And I said, God, all I did was say when I realized that it was mine. Because you said it. And then I spoke it out out of a clean vessel and believing pure faith. And I left it there. I didn't have to do anything else. And he set up a circumstance for it to happen for me. I can go on and on about things when there's power. When it's not hindered. Mm, okay, let me say this. Ephesians. Let me go here. Paul said, let me put it in, in another. There's something somebody might. Um, exceedingly, abundantly, we'll go to King James. Paul said, mm -hmm, um, that God is able to do exceedingly. Let me let me go above. I think it's two or three. Mm -mm. 320. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Mm. There's something that's blocking the power and God wants to remove everything that is hindering you from blocking the power from God's power working in you so that he can do exceedingly abundantly. So his power is not blocked. Mm -hmm. So that his power is not blocked. Dunamis. This word is dunamis. Miraculous power, ability, abundance, mighty work, deeds, power, strength, violent power, mighty, wonderful work. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, dare ask or think according to the power dunamis power of God that is at work in us. And so God wants to do something, but he can't because the vessel, if it's not a clean house, it's not a strong house, it's not able to carry the vessel. If it's not, if it's the house that is hindered by other things, he can't, he can't, the power is not going to work, operate in its fullness. There's some power, but it, you know, like if something's not getting full strength, say you plug something in and it's don't, let me see, how can I say, um, you step on the gas and it goes zoop, Zoop. <laughs> Let me see. If you plug something in and it get a little power, but it don't heat all the way up, it doesn't do all that it was meant to do because it's not getting the fullness of the power. And so you might have some power and the church has settled for that kind of power. I have. Oh, I could pray for somebody. I can lay hands, you know, the tears and, you know, you see the power of God working when something is going on with my children, when there has been many situations, they're not perfect, but God warns me and I can pray through and break through. And you see that, but God wants more, right? In my own life, he has kept me, but there's more, there's more exceedingly abundantly above all. All And it reminds me of when I first got saved, which is why I shared that testimony, because there were things when we are young in the Lord. And I know I look young to some of y'all, and I'm probably much younger than some of y'all in the Lord, but I've been serving him for 24, 25 years. When you're young in the Lord. And you ask him something and it just happens, you know, you he wants to. He, you're getting to know him and, and he's doing things and it's just happening, right? And 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 you're asking for things. And then he has to teach you to hear his voice. He has to teach you. It's like a baby. You give them things, but then you want them to know, don't do that. I You begin to tell your children, go sit down. You expect them to follow that. You can have this when you sit down. You can have your food when you sit down. Sit down. And I'll bring it to you. Crying is not going to get it because I need you to learn how to sit down and eat a meal. You need to do your homework. So those are the things that we begin to do. So God begins to bring us up in the Lord so we can mature. And then as many times as we grow in the Lord, we get away from that, that simplicity 
a relationship with him when everything comes easy, but he has to teach us faith. He has to teach us discipline. We have to learn obedience and we learn obedience to the things that we suffer. And so then we have to break through these things and we have to cling to that hope in Christ. We have to cling to our relationship. We have to give it priority. We have to give the things of God priority. And in a distracted world, world, it's hard to do. And so God wants you to clean some things out so that you can be a, clean, a, a strong house. A clean house is a strong house. So he wants you to clean some things out. And again, it doesn't have to look like the world, the sin that the world describes. It doesn't have to taste not, touch not, you know, all of these things. It doesn't have to be that, but it's what he's put his finger on for you. So Ask God what he wants you to do, what he wants you to get rid of so that you can go to the next level. So he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you've asked or seen. If you've been in the Lord for some time, you've probably seen miracles or if you, if you don't believe in miracles, I don't know who is watching, but maybe you've seen answers to prayer. Maybe you've seen certain things, but God wants to do something new. God wants to do something different. God wants to bring breakthrough. God wants to use you in a new way. He wants to work through you. We are vessels of the Lord that he uses. We are his witnesses. We are those, if, if we, sometimes we're the only Christ that certain people are going to see, the only Christian that people are going to see, the only testimony. We bring the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus Christ where we go. And that is through him triumph. And to some, the Bible says, Paul said to some, it's the fragrance of death and some it's the fragrance of life. It depends on where they're at in their own life. But you, beloved, are to bring that. I am to bring that. And so what are we smelling like? What fragrance are we bringing? And that is so, so important. And so I just want to ask you uh -uh, and to share with you that um, in this year of the house, in this year when God is building his house, when he is reestablishing his house, where there has been some wear and tear, there has some, been some things where they have not been taken care of correctly. And, may, and if this is not for you, don't worry about it. Save it for somebody who is for, share with somebody who might need this, maybe everything. Maybe you don't have anything that you need to deal with. But I believe God is calling us back to a consecrated life. And, may, and I don't mean um, many of us live consecrated lives to such a degree. But again, when God woke me up, gosh, I need to close, okay? One hour and 30 minutes. That gives me nine more minutes. I'm going to be done. So when God gives me, when he woke me up that night and he showed me the vessel, he showed me clean house and he showed me a strong house. He began to show me that there were things that when we don't have, that there are the little things. It's the little things. It's not always the big things. But any time that we, as his vessels, touch something unclean, it makes us unclean. You, as his holy habitation, when you touch something unclean, it makes you unclean. We got um, somebody over here doing something. So we it makes it makes you unclean, right? Uh, um, so it makes you. Sorry, I had to go on a report. Somebody putting all this stuff on here. It makes you unclean. When you touch something. So I want you to ask yourself. And again, I've already prefaced this. Paul and Peter talked. Mm -hmm. I blocked them as well. Paul and Peter talked about what was required 
of the church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ, that the laws and the rituals of the Jewish religion would not be put upon them. Those things that they couldn't even do themselves would not be put upon them. They said the only thing is do not eat food uh, offered to idols, drink things with blood, or fornicate. And if they do that, they should be okay. That's basically what Peter wrote to Paul and, and they agreed to, or they had in the meeting and they sent the letter to. So with that being said, right, with that, when we talk about holiness, but he still said he wanted us consecrated and set apart. Paul talked about um, the, the temple of God cannot be connected with the temple of, of what did he say? What is that in Corinthians? Baal, Baal, whoever it is, that we, it's still again, clean and unclean. And so, who is it? Um, who is it? What is it that you might need to let go? So I don't want to, I'm saying that because I don't want to be religious, right? I don't want to bring you all of this. God also called us to live an abundant life and enjoy life, but there's balance. All things are lawful, but not all things are permissible. All things are lawful, but I will not be bound or controlled by anything. So then what is it that you, that God that may make you weaker, that may make you not a strong vessel. And the, it's the enemy's trick to lie to us and tell us that we're fine until we're not. It's the enemy's trick to tell you that you could, you know, do anything you want to do and serve the Lord. But he says, if you're touching something unclean, that's what I want to say, then it makes you unclean. And then you're an unclean vessel bearing the ark or the presence or the, or the things of God. Right. And so he wants to call us back to holiness. This is what he was saying to Haggai. Tell the pe the priests, tell those we're priests and kings unto God. And so he was saying, tell my people that serve me that before you put one, lay one brick, that when you're doing the work of the Lord and you have touched something unclean, a dead thing, then that makes you unclean. Now, he was talking about the religious laws. But what are you what might you be touching that is stopping and blocking the power of God? I'm not just working in you, but for you in your life, in your own circumstances? Is it something backbiting? Sometimes we talk about people, we complain, but the Bible says with the same measure that you judge, you will be judged. So maybe you're saying something and it's coming back on you and you can't figure out why, but you over here doing this over here because oftentimes that's what happens. So we do something over here and then we get it back in another way and we don't understand why it's coming back in our face this way because we sold it over there, but you don't get to say where well, your spiritual seed grows up, sir and ma'am. And so that we have to be careful about what we're sowing and what we're speaking of over other people's life, lives, least it come up in our lives. So that's one thing that I just want to mention, but what is it that you might be touching that is not unclean? He said, touch not the unclean thing. And so what is it in your life? Maybe there's some things, I'm gonna encourage you, um, there's some things that I like to um, watch like on YouTube. It's not really bad, but it's like, okay, where's this? Is it? And that's just me. God might be saying that's fine for you, but there's like, um, <laughs> I won't name it, but it's like a workout, but they have like ratchet music with it. It's like this workout, but I love the workout. I love the energy of these women are given just awesome energy. They're working out together and there's just so much community. But I'm like, do y'all have like a, a, a Christian set? Because y'all be playing some music I have never even heard of, but the Lord has said you can't, you can't do that because when you're touching, and that doesn't mean that I'm not talking about them or people. I'm just saying that when we let things in our ear gate, in our eye gate, and we are around things and people, then it begins. If you touch something unclean, then you become unclean. And you and the enemy's trick is that you don't know it. You don't even realize it. And because there's so many things out here, so much has gotten mixed in with Christianity. And again, we have to win souls. So you have to get a fish before you can skin them. So we cannot be 
religious out here throwing, hitting people over the head with the Bible. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus ate with publicans and sinners, but Jesus himself, even though they called him a wine biber and he actually drank wine. And, you know, some people will say, what well, was grape juice? The Bible said it was wine. Um, but the point is that he was a clean vessel. You cannot go in and save sinners. You will come become like them unless you are not there to party with them, but to to save souls. You have a mission from God. That doesn't mean you look down upon them, but you go in on a mission, on assignment to help them. Otherwise, we can get pulled in. It says, love the sinner, hate the sin, hate the garments of sin, the Bible says. That God wants us to win souls and in, in, in trying to win souls, we have tried to become like them. And I know this is not a popular message, but the vessels of the Lord have to be clean. And so he's requiring more of us to carry the heavier weight of glory that he has for his people. And it's and it's not an easy thing because the Bible says that you have to count the cost for the high calling because there's some things that you have to leave behind, some things that can't go, some things you can't do, some things that you had gotten used to. Just like Lot and Abraham, they had to disconnect at a certain point. Lot had Abraham had to let go. And this was not because he was um a sinner, it was because God had something else for him. So every time God is taking you to another level, there will be things in people that can go. There will be new things in people and there will be things in people that just cannot go. There will be habits and things that you were doing that that you can still do. And there will be things that he says, I'm going to need you to lay that down. I'm going to need you to put that down. And sometimes it's as simple as like, I need you to exercise. I need you to eat healthy because I need your energy. It's not always spiritual. Sometimes it's, are you getting rest? Are you eating right? Are you exercising? Are you doing things to take care of yourself so that you have a clear mind so that you can read my a word? What are you doing with your time? I'm going to need you to spend time with me. Sometimes we get so super spiritual. And a lot of times God wants us to do, we're body, soul, and spirit. So he wants us to do things in our body that will affect our soul and our spirit. And so anyway, I just want to encourage you because your body mm -hmm, is the temple, the house of the Holy Ghost. So maybe there's something that he wants you to do. There are many people who have a word. And, you know, this witchamajiggy, this situation, this pandemic is out here taking, you know, lives and all of that. But there are some things we do what we know to do and let God do the rest. And so we don't know. We believe that God is not going to take us out one minute too early. Right. As the saints of God, because the Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So we believe that. But the other thing is that. Not only do we believe that about the Lord, but we also believe um, that we can do what we're called to do. John said, I pray that you would be in good health and prosper even as your soul prospers. Right. And so. There's something about health. That creates prosperity, that takes you into your wealthy place. And so as I was talking about wealthy place, right, I believe that God is taking people into a place of wealth and not just money. But that means exceedingly abundantly above all that you dare ask or think. That means a place of peace, of rest, of walking in your purpose, of seeing the promises of God come to pass in your life. Peace, purpose, rest, promise. I don't know. I think there's a fifth one. But the ones that the Lord showed me, but, but there's something about that as he's taking you into that, that includes good health. And because good health has to do with rest as we are wealth in my healthy. Yes. As we are his vessels. Right. And so we want to be healthy. We want to eat healthy. We want to respect our bodies as the temple of the Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to put down a relationship that God haven't called you into. Somebody needs to put down fornication where you saying, well, it could be something else that I'm doing. Somebody needs to, oh God, here I have to go. I have to go here. Somebody needs to put down um, masturbation, pornography, Somebody needs to put down some secret things that other people can't see. 
but you're bearing the vessel of the Lord. And the Bible says that a clean house is a strong house. Gossiping, lying, cheating. There's things that need to be put down. Wishing ill toward people. You know that there's people in ministry that wish ill toward other people, that there's even competition in, in ministry. There's so many souls that need to be saved, so many voices that need to be heard. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And God looks at the inner heart, the heart. People look at the outward appearance, but man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so I just want to encourage you, whatever you're dealing with, we're all dealing with something. And sometimes God won't try. Sometimes we try and do everything at once. It's like going on a diet, you know, like I want to get rid of everything. I'm going to stop eating everything. And by 2 p.m., you stopping at the fast food. <laughs> by 2 p.m., you done gave up on it because you were doing it out your flesh, trying to do it in your own power and might. God says one thing. He's looking for one thing. One thing. What is that one thing that you can offer to God? And I'm going to share this. I promise I'm closing. I have a book. It's a freebie on my website. So you can get it. It's free. And I. it's probably already linked in here. And it's called Five, Question, Five Clarifying Questions for Every Season of Life. And I hadn't even thought about this. I'm also having the called conference. I'll put the link in there. It's September 18th. Um, Saturday, September 18th. Um, and that is um, the called conference. And it is... Um, it's for women calling God's daughters to the heart of the father. And you can join us in person or online. We are in California, but let's go back to the 17, the five questions for every season of life. Five questions. God asks us, what are we supposed to, what are you listening to? Who, what is God asking you to lean into? What is, what voices are you listening to? Sometimes we ask God why things are happening, but God wants us to ask what you're doing in this season. So when you begin to ask the right questions, the answers begin to come. And so ask God, not why is this happening, but God, what do you want me to lean into? What should I be listening to, giving my ear to? We know that that should be God, but who else? And then there is what do you want me to lay down in this season? And what do you want me to lift up in prayer? And what do you want me to learn? What are you trying to teach me in this season? And when you begin to ask him those questions, he will reveal the beauty, the blessings, the purpose, and the lessons in your season. And so you can go to my website, kristapetaford.com. I think there's a link in here, but you can go and you can download that free resource. And if you want it, and then you... Um, subscribe to my blog to get it. You can get it. And then you could unsubscribe after you get it if you want to. I just want to make that available um, to people. If you're walking through this season, if you're, if you're asking God about that one thing that he, that he wants you to lay down, then go through that process in this free guide, the questions that you should be asking. God, I just gave you some of them, the five questions, but I go into detail about what that looks like in that guide. And as you go into, as you do that before the Lord, as you get quiet before the Lord and sit with the Father and lean into his presence, he will show you what he wants you to lean into. To lean into something means to focus with intention on it. What is that one thing he wants you to lean into? Who does he want you to listen to? Sometimes we're listening to the wrong voices. So he may want you to let stop listening to something. And then he may want you to start listening to someone new. Maybe there's um, a new teacher that he wants to put in your life, a teacher of the word, somebody to, from a different perspective. There are, there are, there's my pastor and the, my regular church, but then there are people that I listen to and I, and I glean from their ministries and I watch on a regular basis. Who does he want you to listen to? And then, you know how some seasons you'll be listening to somebody and then God will say, I want you to focus. He'll put, drop somebody new on your feed or something like that. And he'll tell you that that's who you should be listening to. They have a word. They're going to help you. They're, they're teaching on something that he is doing in your life. And so who does he want you to listen to? 
What does he want you to let go of? There's some things that you need to let go of. And that's what we're really talking about. What is the one thing that he's putting his hand on? And then what does he want you to lift up? There's some things that we want to let go of that God says, keep praying about. It's like Jesus, when he said, okay, when the man, he gave the parable of the tree that wasn't bearing no fruit or the vine. And he said, well, um, cut it down. And the vine dresser said, well, can you give it another um, give it another season, another year. And if it doesn't bear any fruit, then can we cut it down? But let me have a little bit more time. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to give you a little bit more time. And so those are the things that God says to continue to lift up to me. Some things he said, let go. We don't want to let go of. Some things he says, hold on. We want to let go of, but we need to ask him because he gives us the instruction, the direction, and he corrects us. It's his voice. It's his leading. It's the Holy Spirit. So ask him that. What do you want me to lay down? What do you want me to lift up and keep lifted in prayer? And what do you want me to learn? Instead of why am I going through this? God, what do you want me to learn? What are the lessons in this season? What do you want me to get? What do you want me to do over? If I'm crossing this mountain, if I'm going around this mountain again, it's something I didn't get. So what do you want me to get this time that I could be a vessel of power? that I don't miss it, that every door to the enemy is closed and that the new doors, I can walk through them with power. And this time I can birth out what you have given me to birth out and the gates of hell will not prevail. So get the lesson in this season that you don't have to get it in the next season that you could use it. But God bless y'all. I think my son keep calling me, so I'm gonna call him back. And um, yeah, I just wanted to get on. My God, I don't want an hour and 40 minutes. I talk a lot especially when I'm talking about Jesus. But anyway, so I just wanted to share and I wanted to share this word. I will probably put together a shorter video of the Hebrew biblical uh, review of the year, but I wanted to have some time to just teach and go deep. And so I decided to do it on a live because that makes the most sense when you're going this long. But I will definitely put together something that just gives a overview of the biblical year 5782 which we are about to enter into in the next week or so i think it's september 6th at sundown i believe it is and so the prophetic expression over this year the year of the house god wants to build his house he wants to restore the foundation rebuild the ancient ruins he wants to make it so that the power of God can work in and through you. And so God bless y'all. Please like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, uh, I shall see y'all. Thank you for um, rocking with me and hanging out with me for a while. Whoever is there, leave your name. And don't forget in the, in my, in my, um, in the description will be a link to that free um, thing. And I think it will be a link to call conference. If it's not, I'll put it in there for women who want to join us online. God bless you.